All right. Well, it looks like the room is um, still filling up just a bit, but it is um, 7.01, and so we are going to get started. I want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for the second installment of Ask the Real Expert webinars scheduled for Aphasia Awareness Month. My name is Mara Silverman, and I am joined by my co-host, Catherine Noyce, and three amazing panelists who I'll introduce now, but we'll tell we'll learn a little bit more about them soon. If you can give a wave, y'all. Angie Cawthorn, Sean Fleck, and Coleman Watson. Looks like Brooke, Brooke Lane has also joined us. We're thrilled to see you. Now, if you all have followed the National Aphasia Association through their Instagram, their Facebook page, and their mailings, then you are undoubtedly very impressed with the amount of aphasia awareness that they are participating in this month. And I get to start sharing a little bit about what's going on today. Closed itself there, okay. So today you're joining us for Ask the Real Expert. Real meaning relatable, experienced aphasia leaders. During the month of June, you will be invited to come to these real experts every Thursday at 7 p.m. These videos will also, it'll be the same link, the Ask the Expert link that you joined us on today. What the plan is, is that we will show you videos of people with aphasia across the nation that speech pathologists and other individuals with aphasia and groups have sent into us. And if you saw our June 1st presentation, the question was, how do I teach my family and friends about aphasia? We are so thrilled, thank you so much, Catherine, that this is already up on the National Aphasia Association's YouTube page. I encourage you, if you have not seen it, to go and watch. Tonight, we have a new question, which is how did the pandemic change how you educate people about aphasia? Let's see if I can move this so it's out of the way. Following that, videos, we will have a live panel discussion with real experts. There are three individuals with aphasia that are joining us. And these individuals have been asked because they are passionate and they are aphasia experts. They're going to share their thoughts on our videos. And like you, they want to teach other people about aphasia. And they're going to tell you some of the stuff that they're doing. Throughout this hour, we do hope that you use the chat feature or the question and answer at the bottom of your Zoom computer or iPad, whatever you're on, to share with us your questions or chat. The question again is, how did the pandemic change how you educate people about aphasia and its impact? I'm gonna go ahead and share that video now. The bottom line, the pandemic, it changed everything about my approach to education as it relates to spreading awareness about this thing we call aphasia. In fact, it changed everything about my approach to teaching others that had aphasia like I did to develop more fluency, clarity, so when they went out, they could operate with confidence as they interacted with others. Because 
the struggle was real. All of a sudden, we found ourselves locked down. And we had to reimagine ourselves, rethink our approach, and in some cases, reinvent my method of doing what I was meant to do. I love to teach. The truth be told, I am an advocate for all things of Asia. So I was just searching for a way to broaden my audience. So I found it in Zoom, Facebook, TikTok, LinkedIn, Twitter, all things social media, I've delved into it full blast. And surprisingly, it worked. I built an audience that I can count on that shows up every day, every time, without fail, no exceptions. And I'm so proud of that. I have formed so many friendships after I had my stroke with good people, the best people, warriors, all of them. And I had an idea to launch this thing called Project Hope. And they participated in that and we spread it globally. It was so good, so good, so thank you. And now we're building a state-of-the-art retreat center in Wildwood, Georgia, to conduct aphasia together retreats. The first one is scheduled the third week in October. Can you imagine that? So it changed my approach. It did. But all in all, hope does find a way. It does. Hi, my name is uh, Rose Shove. I'm the founder and CAO of uh, the Aphasia Center of Acadiana. I have aphasia. Um, uh, the pandemic made me m more isolated. Um, I wasn't feeling isolated before then, but it made me feel isolated because I, I, I had nothing to do, uh, no uh, where to go, and I was scared of everything. So um, we instituted uh, Zoom um, and uh, um, that was a, a breath of fresh air to me to see everybody on Zoom. Um, uh, we've had support meetings, uh, uh, um, book clubs, um, and um, it made me feel like uh, I was connecting to uh, 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 other people. Um, so anyway, um, we've had... Um, support group meetings virtually uh, still offered um, because uh, people that can't drive, um, um, uh, still want the connection. So anyway, um, we started a, a, um, a YouTube video for aphasia and about aphasia and um, uh, the people with aphasia can share um, their stories um, and uh, we've got a lot of good people uh, that uh, is on the videos and um, sharing their stories and, uh, and social media has uh, taken off uh, uh, and uh, 
they can share uh, their uh, stories with um, their families and friends to educate the um, people about aphasia. And um, we've had more social media content on how to better educate uh, the people with aphasia, um, uh, how to communicate with them. Thanks to the National Aphasia Association, we've reached more people than we thought we could ever reach. Hi, this is Tom Broussard. Thank you very much, National Aphasia Association and the affiliates uh, having us do these questions and answers that'll be filmed for the community to see more about what each one of us are doing around the country in terms of what we are providing to our community, our state, and nationally as well, but giving us some, some tips that each one of us are doing on our own and then hoping that other people can listen to this and say, oh, that's a tip I haven't done before. Um, so that's what we are working on. Um, so I'll really start, and I know there's only four minutes, and I talk fast anyway, um, but uh, I'll talk nationally and get down to the community component of it. Um, of course, I run Aphasia Nation, and we've been doing a national uh, survey of stroke-centered hospitals around the country. Uh, there are about 2,500 hospitals that are stroke-centered hospitals, and so far we have uh, interviewed um, and surveyed 418 hospitals. Uh, the good news is that we're doing this, right? The good news is that we are actually talking to those universities, I'm sorry, to those hospitals and finding out what they do and don't provide in terms of, of aphasia awareness for the community as well as the people with stroke and aphasia. Uh, un unfortunately, 92% uh, of those hospitals of the 418 so far have provide no information about aphasia or so little that it's not useful at all. 92%. Um, so we've been doing this for a long time. We have found that there are about 25 of those, uh, 35 of those hospitals out of the 418 that are on the good side of the, the uh, continuum. And one of those hospitals is Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and they have got, they've gotten the award on January, June 1st for aphasia month. And um, they've done a lot of work about aphasia and obviously we are urging them to do a lot more work and then also urging them to put more out on the press in locally in, in Missouri as well as around the country about why it's so important that they um, have done what they've done in terms of that award for uh, aphasia uh, uh, awareness for this, this year. So that's what we're doing nationally. Um, the uh, the what we're doing by on the state, um, I'm on the Acquired Brain Injury Advisory Council uh, for the government for the governor, and as a result, I'm also doing a survey for all of the 39 uh, health uh, um, entities, hospitals, and other entities here in Maine, and I'm making it a report. I'll be providing that to the council on June 26th for aphasia month. Um, and they will get to see, I'll say unfortunately, um, that there are only two hospitals so far that have uh, much good information about aphasia out of the 39. And only one of those is stroke centered. The other one is not stroke centered, but clearly that hospital has put more information about aphasia in their website. So that too is very important because they will get to see it. They get to see this report. Uh, so that too is part of how everybody has to come to understand why aphasia is so important, given that 30 to 40% of people with stroke also have aphasia. Unfortunately, <laughs> the people with aphasia don't get a whole lot of information going forward. So it does, do an, it does help a lot to talk with the community, talk with your local SLP, uh, find out and talk with the local stroke coordinator, if it's a stroke-centered hospital, uh, go to the press, put material out for stroke and aphasia months every year, uh, and presentations with any number of, of uh, health 
uh, entities. So there's all kinds of information, uh, including, of course, add in your state, add a, a vanity license plate called aphasia. I have one here in Maine. There are only six states so far that have a vanity plate about aphasia. So that's sort of the beginning and the end of the national to the state to the local community. But I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at the next um, uh, NAA affiliate meeting and have a great uh, aphasia month this year. Take care. Can you tell me again, Keith, about three years ago and being out and yeah, then having to Zoom? Yeah, I mean, th uh, three years ago and before uh, uh, scale um, and Loyola and all the things, but now Zoom uh, and that's it. I mean, one week or, or one month is okay, but three years and 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 more. It's just it, a really zoom, and that's it. It's just not the same thing. So it's just. I mean, it's weird for me. It's for for me. It's just not good. I'm um, uh, Gail in scale, not um, Zoom and stuff. And that's really good for me. Um, but it's just not the same thing. Yeah, Geneva, what do you think about the pandemic changing the way we educate people about aphasia? I think that um, I learned to use the, put the thing away. That's number one. Um, still talking to people. Um, I think that I, I'm not, um, I'm staying online. That's number one. Um, I, I'm sorry. It's good for you or not good for you, though. Well, I'm. I can use. Um, I do a lot. I do my stuff online. Yeah. See, for me, no. Uh, I mean, one week or one month, it's okay. But uh, um, four years online, it, it's just not for me. But when I first started, I was able to drive. That was the one. Um, when I was still driving, in the, I get that's part of it. So when I was driving, it was I was okay. You um, yeah, and me too driving, so it's okay. But now yeah. you is no because uh, uh, it's not good. So uh, um, exactly. Zoom, and then it's good for you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But you're actually you use your car. Yeah. 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 See, and I think um, believe it or not, a lot of women go so, uh, yeah, so without their cars. No. Mm -hmm. so, um, <laughs> I'm assuming that, but um, I think um, I'm one of the, a person that um, I do um, with my and with my stroke and the cancer. Um, it is so many things still go. Um, they they's able to change. Mm -hmm. Things have changed now. It's go going to do better. I mean, it, it's really good, I think. Hi, everyone. I am Janetta Jackson, Esquire. Um, thank you for sharing my story. Um, I'm a practicing labor 
and employment attorney. Um, I had my stroke on June 16, 2020, and I will remember that day for the rest of my life. Um, I was diagnosed with severe aphasia and apraxia, um, but with God's grace, my faith and motivation, I relearned my ABCs, my one, two, threes, my numbers, um, and to speak again. Um, aphasia is a condition that affects language, either written or spoken due to a brain injury, um, like a stroke. Um, it's the loss of words, even though you have them in your head, you can't produce them or, you know, communicate them to the person that you're talking to. Um, so the question was, how did the pandemic change how you educate people about aphasia? Um, first off, acceptance. Perhaps the most frustrating thing about my aphasia was my acceptance of my ability to communicate flawlessly. And, and also there is a stigma that is associated with acquired disabilities. Um, well, my family and friends, thank you for accepting the new Janetta. Um, I'm harder on myself than anyone else. Um, and, and, and I'm harder on my, myself than my family and my friends. Um, but I have accepted my aphasia. It was a process, um, but now I'm better than before, spiritually, emotionally, physically, um, mentally, and most importantly, I'm healthy. Um, the second thing about aphasia is I would like to educate my family and friends um, to have patience um, have patience with me when I'm having difficulty pronouncing some of my words. Um, I use the incorrect words sometimes. And I just want to say, please excuse me uh, when that happens because it's just my aphasia. It really is. Um, it's a process um, and it seems complicated. Um, but it might be a blessing in disguise because it has helped me appreciate the beauty of language. <laughs> um, looking at my stroke journey, I know that I came a long way from June 16, 2020. And I have learned that life is not always predictable, but with God, but, but but with faith in God and hard work and determination, you can overcome even the biggest obstacles and hurdles that come your way. All right. Thank you for listening. How come? I blamed it on my aphasia on the pandemic. I blamed it on the pandemic. First of all, hmm. it had a lot of consequences. Hmm. I figured the pandemic was isolating yeah hmm. so the pandemic was already isolating us telling us you had to stay in the house and you have to find new ways to do things and then having aphasia right yeah so right. Kurt, how, Kurt I'm going to ask you a question how did you tell people about your aphasia when you couldn't even be around them I, yeah, I don't know. Did your family communicate with other people in your family about what was going on? Yes. 
Yeah, yeah. My family did too. Yeah, how did they do that? They printed out aphasia information for me and I passed it out with one of my women's club huh. and the garden club. My daughter decided to tell, I'm sorry, I'm crying, I'm sorry. Okay, Susan. Especially, especially to people that really love me. So she just sat down and um, told them, and she did a very good job of it. And so they have not, they just treat me like I will, always was and was. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. your daughter took a lead on communicating with your family. Yes, she was very, um, she didn't tell everybody in the world, you know, right. she, she didn't want people to think I was an idiot, really, yeah. you know, and so um, I was, that was really good that she did that for me. I came in about the time that that's happening, so I didn't know what it was like before that. But what I needed was, um, because I liked it, but I needed to give me <laughs> how to use Zoom. We talk about our brain, but I needed to know what is that little box down there when you turn red, red and this and that and the other. And I was like, I don't know what that is. So I could... That's what I could have done. And I liked having Zoom. So that was really important. So on top of having aphasia, now you have to learn a new whole new system to communicate. Right. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Ladeth. I was affected by a stroke on February 14 of 2021, which is Valentine's Day. Cupid was not really nice to me at all even though I still love him, but that's okay. We don't deal with that as the time goes by until next Valentine's Day for the future. Um, my stroke affect me, affected me during the pandemic, uh, in the middle of the pandemic, which was very hard. Uh, during that time, in the, at the pandemic time, uh, I was stayed in the hospital for three weeks. I was limited to visitations during that time. I was only allowed to have one visitor, but being that my one visitor was my son and he was not allowed to visit, he was unable to visit me at that time. So I was able to uh, change my visitor to one other person. After that, I transitioned to a rehab in Lafayette, which is Ashna, Lafayette Ashna uh, Rehab, which it was a great rehab. I was able to, during that time, I had speech occupational and physical therapy, which really helped me during the transition of my stroke. While I was in there, I was allowed, they had lifted the restrictions on visitation, so I was allowed to have two visitors at that time, which was still was restricted, but I did work it out with those visitors at that time. Uh, when we had our family group meeting, uh, I was allowed to have four visitors at that time, which they transitioned to teach me how, they transitioned to teach the family how to assist me at home during that time. On my visitation during my time with the visitors in UL, the visitation in the hospital and the rehab, uh, it did, I, I was isolated and did put me into a stage of depression because I was not uh, able to have more visitors or friends or family. I did have a friend who did sneak in and saw me at that time because her husband was in the hospital, but and that did encourage me and gave me some some hope because I was able to see one of my coworkers, which really was great. But uh, you're being without your, your family, being that you don't have your family by, by your side to be with you during those time can be very hard and 
make it be very sad and depressing moments for individuals uh, during that time. Um, one of the goals that I set for myself that I would like to do in the near future would become, is to become an advocate for people who's been affected by stroke or aphasia. Being that I see in the public eyes and um, people who has been affected by a stroke, they're not aware or they, they don't have a voice for them, anyone advocating for them, and they don't know, uh, they're, not, they're unaware of uh, the support that is available for them to help assist them. So I would like to be that person who goes out and would, that the person that would reach out to them and assist them as much possible as even if it's doing a one-on-one, -on -one, doing a group seminar, or just whatever it takes to get the word out for stroke awareness and aphasia. Um, Jane, yeah. when we take a look at how the botanic changed, how we educated people about aphasia and the impact when we think about our speak out aphasia class, what did we do? We went from in-person educating people to what? Zoom, oh my goodness, it would be such a delight to have Zoom because I couldn't have the, um, um, because I was living in Washington DC and the Baltimore region. And I said, oh my goodness, I couldn't get there. So yeah, I'm so fascinated by that. Yeah. Yes, and so it allowed you to be a part of this, our, of, of our team. Yeah. And without even leaving your house, you've been able to educate people. And, and right now, who are we educating? We're educating, educating the world. Like, I guess, um, well, let's see, um, Johns Hopkins uh, University and SCALE and some of the SCALE members and um, this, I mean, um, Towson University. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Wasn't it? It was so. So it hasn't prevented us from continuing to educate people. People. Oh. It actually. Would you say we have actually been able to educate more people? Oh dear Lord, yes. Because <laughs> we're think. educating them on Facebook too. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely, and it and would you, would you say that it 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 is now become the normal to be able to you to go to do in persons, but also do Zoom too? Oh dear Lord, yes, mm -hmm. yes, because I guess I'm, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. No, it's so it's uh, uh it's given us many options now that we didn't have before COVID, right. Yes, oh my goodness, yeah. did we ever? Mm -hmm. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you were as touched by those authentic aphasia voices as I was. Um, as I mentioned, we follow we are following these incredible videos by asking our panelists that you've met just briefly to join us for a live discussion. They will give us some of their feedback on those videos. If you have a question, feel free to ask um, in the chat or in the Q&A, and we'll get to those as well. So I would love if each of you could say hello to our guests from around the country and just share with you, share with them where you're joining us from, and then we'll get into a little bit more. So Angie, can you go first? 
I most certainly can. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, I am uh, Angie Cawthorn. I am joining you from Morristown, New Jersey, uh, close to Philly. Go, go birds. Um, <laughs> um, I had a stroke, uh, two strokes, um, 2017, and um, I uh, am. I was absolutely blown away by the uh, candidness and the um, the quality of the videos, and it just lets me um, know that we are definitely on the right track. And the Absolutely. work that we are doing is so important. Um, I have, uh, should I mention my stuff? Is this- where Well, I just happens, let's introduce everybody. And yeah, then we're good. We'll <laughs> let's come back, introduce everybody. And then I'd really love a little more um, feedback on what you all thought of the videos, what everybody's doing. And then also share what you are doing um, in your roles to get the word out about aphasia. Sean, would you mind going next, please? Sure, my name is Sean Fleck and I now live in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I had a stroke 10 years ago and I suffered massive, extreme aphasia. I could, I could speak right away after I had a stroke, but yet you could not hear, understand what I was saying. I used a lot of jibber jabber. And so it took me a long time to figure that out and to get back into speaking. And so that's, that's about it, it right now. And I'll come back and I'll mention more about me. Awesome. Thank you. And Coleman, would you mind introducing yourself as well? Okay. Hi, I'm Coleman. I'm in Orlando, Florida. It's um, very, very, very hot right now. It's like 90s. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, my stroke was about almost four years now. Um, but um, I, of course, at Avasia and Apraxia. Um, and that's why I'm here. Awesome. We have the whole East Coast represented here. Um, <laughs> and we're very hot here in North Carolina as well. So I'm actually going to turn the next like 15 minutes or so over to you all to discuss the videos that you saw and also to share some of the things that you yourself and people in your community are doing to spread the word of aphasia and particularly how that's been very difficult and challenging over the last three years. But as we heard tonight, there's also been some wonderful lessons. So, um, you know, whoever would like to start can share and then I'll help facilitate as we move along. I'll say something. I'll start. I'll start. No, go, go ahead, ahead. <laughs> Coleman. Go ahead, Coleman. Go ahead. Now, uh, I guess this one, I, um, I was shocked with uh, the video when Tom um, gave the statistics on hospitals. And I, I knew that before from my filming with him, but when I see it again, it's just so shocking and, um, and sad. And uh, I hope that um, we can have a difference to change that. Because um, I know a lot of families feel the same when they feel lost, when their loved one has a stroke or aphasia. Um, and the only way to do that is to have spread the word, spread the word more. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great observation. Anyone else? Some video? Yeah. I'll mention, I'll, I, I was really um, not shocked, but I was pleasantly surprised at how much people use Zoom. And know we use Zoom in Raleigh, North Carolina for TAB right away. We took it to, but I know a lot of people couldn't get into that. But I know that myself, when the pandemic happened, um, you had to get outside too. And you had to yeah. walk and with a distance, you had to walk and you had to get outside and just talk to people from a distance. But, uh, but I, I also know that um, my family, I have two daughters and they both live far away. So one lives in Toronto, he lives in Vancouver and I'm Raleigh. And so my whole family was not close by. So it was just my wife and I. So we had to, and my daughter-in-law, my mother-in-law and father-in-law who are 80 years old, we had to get them into Zoom and get them into talking because everyone had to communicate whether you have aphasia or not, you had to communicate with people. And so we started a weekly chat and uh, it, and it really, it was amazing how people who 
family members who you talk to once a month, then you talk, to, now you talk to them every week. And it was really encouraging. And then everyone, and people with aphasia, people understand um, you have aphasia that you have to slow down, you have to give them, give them time to speak. And I was really pleased that everyone took Zoom up and they went crazy. Like they did uh, amazing things. Yeah, I agree. Angie, can you add to that? I can definitely jump in here. Um, those numbers, Tom, always a great job. Um, and I see you in the chat, so hey. <laughs> but uh, those numbers, um, but um, those numbers are are very shocking. I was um, two things. I was I'm always inspired by Paul Cummings. He's he always brings yeah. uh, such great positive energy. He has this smile. He's just like right there you know I, I love him I love him and I I really need to do better at talk and getting on with him in the morning uh but uh I'm still a fan but um and I saw G or the um G the lawyer mm -hmm. I saw her video on TikTok before I saw it here tonight and I was like that is so awesome and I shared it uh, with people and saved it and um, because and I wasn't looking for it it just popped up because I searched for things with aphasia but um, I the videos and the uh, consistency of what everyone is doing to try to get the word out and not allowing the barriers just like with our aphasia you don't allow that barrier of the pandemic affect us we keep going we keep thriving not just surviving but we kept thriving and giving each other confidence to, all right, hey, you're still on mute. Hey, your camera's not on. Yeah. <laughs> and given that um, that type of encouragement, um, you know, like I was in a choir at uh, a phasia choir during the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, I remember us being in this room with no windows and we're singing like, should we still be singing? Like we should not be in this room with no window. <laughs> but also I realized I needed uh, when I didn't know how much I read lips until everybody had to put on a mask. Uh -huh. I didn't know how much I really relied on lip reading and uh, facial expressions for me to know what's going on until then. So it was a, a, a big transition, but the use of the online platforms that yeah. um, were named have been a tremendous help. I love how each of you pointed out some of what other people are doing because you all are also doing amazing things. But I think that's what the NAA facilitates is that um, we're not in silos and that we need to build each other up and share each other's stuff. And I love how the first thing you said was, I shared her video with other people. And there's a lot of power in that. So that I love how you all thought about that. I can't take away the fact, though, that every one of you have done amazing things and are doing amazing things right now to get the word out. And so you all are very generous and bragging about, about everybody else. But I'd like you to brag on yourself a little now and share what you all have been doing. I'll start. Gonna brag first. I'll, I'll well, start. <laughs> so I'll start. Anyway, so... When I, before I had my stroke, I was a sales and marketing executive and I traveled the world and I had, I enjoyed my job, like no tomorrow. And after I had my stroke, I went back to work um, a little too soon. And I realized this is really impacting my recovery and I can't recover and do my job at the same time. So I retired and I focused on my recovery. And I, I was always a believer on owning your own career own your own life, own your own and not having other people who not manage your life or manage your career. It's always you. And so I took to a saying that you got to own your own recovery. You have to own your own aphasia. You got to get better yourself and mm -hmm. you can ha get help from doctors, from speech, patholog speech pathologists and family members, but you have to own it yourself. You, you can recover as much as you want to. And, um, uh, 
So I, I'm so I'll mention that I'm now doing I'm not doing the sales and marketing executive anymore, but I'm doing nonprofit boards and I volunteer at boards. I'm doing a lot of the nonprofit boards and uh, I'm enjoying that very much. And you're sharing all that stuff that you did over your whole career uh, in such a positive way to make an impact. Angie, what are you up to over there? I'm going to pass it to Coleman because I know right. he has some things he has to get to. Okay, so, Coleman. You know, I got you, bro. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, well, um, as I said, my stroke was about almost four years now. And when I started my speech therapy, um, since I couldn't read or write, I really wanted to watch a film about Avasia um, because books were useless for me at that time. And I tried to find um, some resources on it, but that is not really a lot. So um, my therapist told me, maybe you should try um, uh, project-based therapy to see if I can um, use my prior life in a different way. So before that, I was an attorney. And when you're an attorney, you basically are doing stories for people. Yeah. So I tried to do, um, well, I am doing a documentary um, about Avasia. Um, and I don't, I didn't know anything about um, film. But I got some comfort because a film is just a, a film, uh, sorry, a story again. So uh, the documentary has been working on three years and in two weeks it will be released. And I will um, actually on the chat, I will send you the link if you want to see it. So you can see it on uh, online. And if you're, or if you're in Orlando, you can go to the premiere um, for the documentary and it's free either on uh, internet or in the theater or that one theater <laughs> just one time and after that I'm going to try to enter the documentary into a um, film festival to try to spread the word of, of Asia. That's awesome comment and we have the link for um Catherine is putting the link, not just for the documentary's um, trailer, but also some additional information on each of our panelists too. So make okay. sure you're checking out that. And um, Catherine, if there's any questions or anything, please let me know because otherwise I have to do that squinting thing. So, you know, <laughs> it's much easier. Coleman, that's amazing. And I'm thinking I might go home and ask my husband if we could take a quick trip to Florida instead of just watching it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm thinking road trip. Road right, trip. right. Maybe we could take a bus from up here in North Carolina. Oh. <laughs> All aboard. Thank you, Coleman. That's amazing. Cool. Angie, got the well, floor back. I have the floor back. Um, again, I'm Angie. Uh, I am, um, the co I'm working on a lot of different things with advocacy. I kind of went through in a way of um, not knowing, I'd never heard of aphasia. Um, you know, they don't really tell you um, a lot you know, when you leave the hospital, which is what, again, what Tom was talking about. So it's hard to have a, a, a disorder that nobody's uh, heard of. Yeah. So I made it my business to, and um, I got into research. I found a support group. I got into research and I got my voice back and I find it to be um, my duty to speak for my fellow Ephesians that can't speak as well or maybe haven't gotten their voice back at the same uh uh time like strength that i have yeah. um and you know i know every word i say i don't know if the next word is coming but they're going to i'm going to i'm going to try you know i'm going to try but i'm um i have a podcast called brain friends and the co-host with dr celeste uh today we release season two i'm Woo! so excited we have <laughs> listeners in 42 countries and uh, the response has been really good. I am also the president of ARCH, which is the Aphasia Resource Collaboration Hub. It is a place for, as I think of it as a lighthouse for in these murky waters of aphasia so people can find the 
uh, support clubs, um, the choirs, the, the chair yogas, uh, the research opportunities, stuff like that to, um, you know, so you can kind of plug in. I found in, um, in the area where I live in Philadelphia, I was going to, like I said, I went to a support group. I'm not going to regale you guys with the entire story, but I, um, I was asking the lady who runs the research department where I was at, I said, well, she was telling me about other stuff in Philadelphia. And I'm like, well, how am I supposed to find this other stuff is a lot. Like she was just giving me pamphlet after pamphlet after pamphlet. <laughs> and I'm like, well, first of all, I can't read. Let's just start there. Second of all, <laughs> what am I supposed to do with all these? So um, my idea was to put everything in uh, one place so everybody can find what they need to find. And that's kind of how Arch was born. And uh, that's the, we had our first conference last October. We're having our second one this October. Um, and I'm a resource research ambassador for Temple University because that's where I got my greatest gains. It wasn't that eight weeks in the SLP office. You got to keep working after that, guys. That's where the work is done, is after whatever it is, even if you just go to five below and get a math book, it's about doing that extra work, putting that work in and not allowing things like a pandemic or a stroke or a TBI to stop you from doing the things that you need to do. We all have to readjust, but we're all still here, praise God, and we're all still thriving. And if you're not, you're not thriving, you wouldn't be on this call. If you're not looking, you wouldn't be on this call. So I know I'm talking to the right folks, but we are, uh, we're, we're marching on. Yeah. I'm hearing so, so much about purpose, right? So and someone, hope. someone should, someone should start an, uh, a nonprofit about getting rid of the acronyms for everyone has a, with aphasia. So no more acronyms. <laughs> um, that's fair. Just, that's fair. <laughs> but listen, at the universities, they acronyms. love a, they love an, oh, an analogy. Yeah. When in Rome, my friend. Name. We're not, we're in it, Rome. Yeah. I love it. Catherine, are there any questions that for the panel or some comments that you'd like to share? After you unmute, there you go. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, I think it's very clear from the chat that people are so impressed with what everyone shared in the recording, as well as what all of our experts are sharing tonight. Lots of cheering everybody on. Love the supportive community. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like specific to questions about the pandemic, then we did get one question in the Q&A about um, people and getting jobs and how that might've been impacted by the pandemic. So I don't know if any of you have any thoughts or comments on that and how aphasia has played a role? I think it depends on what your job was before, because if you can go back to doing the same job and some people can, because I know the last person, last uh, ex experts, it was a, he was a uh, uh, professor and he was uh, doing, doing research, also being a professor talking and he stopped talking. Well, he didn't stop talking, but he started doing research and that he can continue his career. Other people need to moderate, modify their careers, um, just like Coleman did and Angie and I have, have done. And I think everyone's got to take it ownership on their recovery and what they want to do and, uh, you know, and move on. The only thing I would add to that is give yourself time. Um, the first three years, I mean, I'm over here showing off with a whole sentence now, but you know, three years ago, it was such, and for the first three years, I didn't even feel like I was getting better. Um, so, and like Sean said, I was a finance manager for the largest car dealership in the country. And all of a sudden I, I numbers just don't make sense and I can't read and I can't write. Um, so it's, it definitely is a fall. And, um, but again, you find your new purpose, you find, what you can do and you focus on helping the people behind you because you know somebody's having a stroke right now and it is my fervent hope that that person that has a, if they have aphasia god forbid that they find me and that i can be a friend to them and be what i was looking for when i was searching because we're all here because we were all searching and a lot of us are the answers that other people are finding so it's just it's just awesome and i'm just so uh thankful to be here. 
And we are all so incredibly thankful for you all sharing these stories and your impressions. And I really hope you're paying attention to the um, chat and grabbing some of those links, look up these folks and um, the things that they're going that are going on. Um, any last thoughts? Because I have just a comment before we close, but if there's any last thoughts, I'll entertain those first. I already said go birds, so we're good. Yes, you did. <laughs> Um, so before we close our program tonight, we really want to acknowledge the tremendous effort that people behind the scenes have done to make these things happen. Um, Denise McCall and Brooke Lang and the entire team at the National Aphasia Association for bringing us all together with such special purpose and during such a special month for all of us. So, um, and thank you to the special um, expert panelists we've had for all the individuals and the groups that sent us videos. I know it's hard to get everything in in four minutes, but y'all did an amazing job. Um, the affiliates that support every single one of our efforts, um, you guys are the ones that make it happen by sharing and collaborating. Like Angie was saying, you can't work in a silo. You gotta keep talking and include everybody. Um, so whether you're watching this live, or you're watching on the recording because it will be uploaded to the YouTube, thanks to Catherine, uploaded to our um, the NAA's website or um, yeah, website and the Ask the Expert series on their YouTube channel. Um, you know, we are speaking directly to you at home. The experts are you. And never forget that your story and your experience, your lived experience with aphasia is powerful and it will impact somebody else's journey. So thank you guys so much on behalf of the NAA. Thank you for the opportunity to um, sit in today and host. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next week, Thursday on the 22nd for another question to ask the experts. Same link. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Good night, John boy. <laughs>